Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar discussion brought to you by Public Technology and Deloitte. My name is Sam, I'm the editor of Public Technology, and I'm delighted to be your host this morning. I'm even more delighted that I'm joined by a really great panel whom I will introduce very shortly, and after which I promise I will do my best to keep quiet and allow you to hear from them. But I'm just gonna very briefly introduce today's event, set the context a little bit and run through how it works. So we're here today to talk about data and how it can help power the delivery of public services and provide ever more valuable insights for public sector organizations. That discussion, the discussion we're here today to have takes place against the backdrop of the ongoing rollout of the government's national data strategy uh, and also other major initiatives such as the development of new data standards to be used across the NHS, alongside which there are a growing number of data centric agencies, including Central Government's Data Standards Authority and the ONS's Data Science Campus, to name just two. But beyond those, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of public bodies of all types who are exploring how data can help them in their delivery of citizen services and designing the policy that supports them. So that being the case, we've certainly got an awful lot to talk about today, and I've got loads and loads of questions I'm really looking forward to putting to our panelists. But I would absolutely encourage you to preempt me in doing so by getting your own questions in. The beauty of these virtual events, I think, is that we don't have to wait until the end uh, for a little 10 minutes to kind of hand the virtual microphone around. Um, we can uh, encourage our audience to get involved throughout the process. So if there's anything you want to ask at any point, uh, you should see a Q&A tab on your screen. Do please go there, put your questions in, even if not a question, but just a comment or a contribution, something, um, an experience you want to share from, from your own organization. Uh, get involved at any point. We're, we're not here to do any presentations today. There's no slides. Hopefully you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised to hear. There's just a chat, so we really want you all to get involved uh, and do please do so throughout. Um, and you can also upvote your questions from your fellow viewers. Uh, if there's one you think is particularly relevant or you'd like to see answers, do please give it a thumbs up and we will try and address your questions in as democratic a way as possible. Um, but I think that's quite enough from me for the time being. Let's, um, let's meet our panel. Um, I'm gonna get a quick introduction from, from each of you one by one, if I may. Let's start with you, Paul. Paul Lodge from the Department for Work and Pensions. Thank you so much for, for being here today. Could we get a quick introduction to, to who you are, your role at the DWP, and a little bit perhaps about where you're coming to today's discussion from? Okay, um, well, thanks very much for um, inviting me. Uh, the Department for Work and Pensions is the, um, the central government department that's responsible for um, working age support, um, support for children, support for pensioners and support for people in poverty. Um, we look after about 22 million citizens per annum. Um, we disperse about £180 billion pounds of, um, of support to um, families and individuals per year. And we've also got about a trillion pounds worth of pension investments. So we're um, uh, quite a large financial services institution if you want to look at it like that and therefore the the, the model that we work um, uh, our data around is very similar to um, a retail insurance services provider with um, understanding eligibility for claims um, and then making those claims payments as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Um, we run similar know your customer checks as we would do or as any large bank would, would do so that we make sure that we're sending the money to the right people. And in terms of our data journey, we're um, on a similar um, trajectory to many other organisations insofar as we have a large heritage estate, which um, varies in age from anything um, uh, from about 30 years old right through to, to brand new um, technologies and cloud-based data architectures. And what we've got to try and do is bring all of that together into a more coherent data architecture in order that we can deliver better customer experience. Uh, great, thank you, Paul. Really look forward to hearing more about that um, over the course of the next hour. Um, but if I can now introduce you to Sigrid Sik from uh, Estonia's 
of Economic Affairs and Communications. Sigrid, thank you so much for, for being with us today. It's really great to have you here. We're always keen to hear about what's, uh, what's happening in Estonia and the great work you guys do. Could we get a quick introduction to, to you and your own role and um, your kind of perspective on today's discussion? Yes, Tere uh, Grigula from Estonia and a huge Aita for inviting me. Uh, and also uh, thanks for reading out the whole name of the ministry. So I can just say that my name is Sigrid and I work for the Estonian government, uh, where I'm focusing on uh, two topics, on the AI powered chatbot and actually a voice-based assistant called Bürokrat that will in the future and kind of already is helping citizens to communicate, communicate with the state uh, in a totally different way. And I'm also still working on the open data initiatives. And I really hope I can share something of interest to the other panelists or at least to the uh, people taking part of this webinar today. But um, I know I will gain uh, valuable insights as well because uh, this is my, I've been taking part of these UK based um, events before and I know that the way you do things is very user centric so uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to learn something new today as well but I, I hope to uh, I, I don't want to make it all that Estonia is the best uh, because oftentimes people think that but we have a lot to learn but we also have a lot to offer so I hope I can do that today. Absolutely, that what a great, great attitude. Um, and thank you so much for being with us. It's really great to, to have you here, Sigrid. Um, uh, and finally, uh, if uh, we can now meet Nadun Mutu Kumarana. Uh, Nadun, thank you so much for, for being with us. It's great to have you here, Nadun from Deloitte. Um, can we get a quick intro to, to what you do for Deloitte and um, how that, that plays into the topics we are here today to talk about? Thank you, Sam, and it's great to be here. Uh, Nadeem Utkumrana, I lead uh, data and analytics services into our public, public sector clients. And in doing so, uh, get to work with uh, major uh, organizations within public sector who, who delivers citizen or public services. And, and what we get to do is to work with those clients to uh, not only have the opportunity to think about, you know, improving services with the use of a better use of data and analytics, uh, you know, solve problems, but also do everything from, you know, strategic strategy and policy thinking all the way to uh, implementing uh, the latest and, and complex technology solutions to deliver data and analytics. So doing this type of work across public sector in the UK, but also linking with, given our uh, global nature of our organization, we, we have the the, the opportunity to link up many international public sector clients as well to compare and contrast what they do. In doing all of this, it gives us the, the opportunity to see things uh, happening across public sector. And as consultants, what we do is not only to share that type of knowledge across different organizations and bring them together, as well as the, the work that we do on an individual basis. So, um, happy to share any of those sort of learnings and insights that we gain as a, as a public sector as a whole as to how data is not only helping already and the things that you can do further to, to improve those services. Great, thank you. I uh, really look forward to hearing more about that as we go on. And a reminder once again uh, for everyone uh, joining us today from the office or from home or from wherever you're uh, tuning in, do please get your questions in for Paul, Nadun and Sigrid. Um, and uh, we look forward to, to addressing them. Um, but if I can start, um, uh, Sigrid, I know you said you didn't want uh, this to be all about Estonia and how great um, everything uh, the Estonian government does is, but uh, it, I'd like to start um, by, by focusing on, on you guys. Um, obviously the, the Estonian government is renowned and celebrated around the world for how comprehensive a set of online services it has for citizens and I guess powering those services is um, data and data sharing platforms that's a really important part of it I guess could you just talk us through um, what the benefits are 
of being so data driven as a government and where you're kind of at in terms of sharing data across across departments yeah, sure and i mean we can talk all day long how great estonia is because it really is but uh, about data sharing um i guess uh what you meant or what's already kind of known uh is the x road which is the data exchange layer uh that is the thing that enables this sharing of data that is stored in uh, all the national registries and to be really honest it was actually created out of a very real need that to save money because it was created in the early 2000s when the young estonian republic so poetic um, uh, had the need to provide state services to its citizens and it didn't really have much money so sharing data was the frugal option and i think that's kind of the key because and i'm just speaking about what i think and in my opinion it's not too useful to set out to be data driven um it's kind of a cool keyword but really difficult to put into numbers and and therefore it might be difficult to prioritize as a goal in itself to be data driven um, because the goal is never to actually collect data and i i know that's not meant by data driven the data drivenness but i feel like the term is still kind of undefined uh, to many in the general public and for us um, data sharing also means cyber safety because there is no need to create super databases which could be seen as as a great place to attack whether they be on paper or, or digital databases and um, thirdly data sharing between agencies means that every agency has their registries where they have to ensure the correctness and quality of their data and they have their domain specific knowledge so they can do it the best and then have others use that hopefully correct and uh, correct data and when i read the national strategy uh, the uk one um, it also said that and i will get this right but we have a duty to do more, especially with the data that the government itself holds. I, I, I kind of feel like we are doing some things. Uh, for example, I live in uh, Tallinn and residents of Tallinn get to ride for free on the public transport. And the ticket selling company is a private sector company and they also use X-Road queries. So once a month, they query data about the place of residence uh, from the population registry and I ride the bus for free and I do it legally um, but further development plans um, I'd also kind of want to reformulate that question um, uh, to further development areas or domains and I feel like that domain uh, in Estonia would be uh, open data and not just because I worked there uh, on open data but it was like criminally overlooked until 2018 and now slowly we have seen agencies publishing open data and I'm sure that this will enrich our uh, data economy in ways that uh, registry data just can't and never will I think you, you touched on a really important point there, the concept of data-driven culture. It sounds wonderful, but I guess as with all kind of new ideas and buzzwords, um, we need to understand exactly what it means and we need to all have a fairly um, shared definition of what it means. And Nadine, if I can come to you on this one, when we talk about a data-driven culture, I guess in this context of, um, of the government and the work you do supporting government, what, what do you think we mean by that? Okay, I, I will start by saying 
I mean, you know, our, our topic today is thinking differently about data and therefore data driven culture. You would, you know, you would ask the question, is this something new or, uh, or, or, or how has it evolved? Data has, you know, a lot of us or even pe people, you know, before us have always been talking about the importance of data in public and private sector organizations, data driven, driven culture. Uh, used to be something that alludes to using data to make uh, decisions more efficiently and, and accurately. Uh, my, my view of how the, in public sector, the, the, the term data-driven has evolved is it used to be something that was more relevant to the, the practitioners uh, the professionals who, who does the data, the CDOs and the, the more technically focused uh, data, uh, you know, professionals in, in, within the organization. But what's happened for a number of different reasons, uh, some good, you know, some, some out of necessity is now the, the concept, what, you, what people used to think to be uh, just a technical, technically driven concept is now becoming and as it should really becoming a, a concept for, for the business itself. When I say business, the actual public sector organizations who are on the front lines delivering services to the, the, to the citizens and the public. So that's the, the most important sort of evolution and the development where data driven is not now just isolated to the data professionals or the guardians, but it's becoming everyone's focus and, and some of the key drivers behind this is, you know, we all know we, you know, going through the pandemic, that really drew, uh, we, we had no choice across public sector as well as all other sectors to uh, not only internally within an organization to use data to, you know, do the, deliver the right type of services at the time of that crisis to, to, to deliver, you know, look after your citizens and to deliver the right type of services, but also across public sector, sharing of data became even more so important than, than, than ever before. So I think that's triggered, you know, the, the, the data driven concept and the notion of it more into the, the minds of the, the, the frontline professionals and the policymakers within public sector organizations to to think uh, how, how you know, now that they've got a, a better taste of it, they want to do more, and 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 that is now you know happening as a, a snowballing effect. Um, the the other thing is uh, going forward, given where we are with the latest type of economic and so, you know social dynamics that's happening across the world, but within our own countries, um, you know the the the, the skills market labor force, the workforce capacity for various different restrictions, again, data and, and also analytics is becoming even really more important to, to, to keep, keep and improve the efficiency and the productivity of organizations. So for all of these reasons, now data driven has become, um, you know, a, a more universally understood there's more work to be done to ed educate and to get people to think about it more but it's becoming much more prevalent um paul if i can <clears throat> come to you um uh, listening to, to Sigrid talk about the, the great work they're doing in, in estonia um in in what is a uh, um as she described a young republic uh, one of the things that struck me is uh, here in the uk we are an old monarchy um and perhaps that i don't know if that um in terms of how our, our government and our structures of government can can drive and perpetuate a data-driven culture, whether that looks a bit different um, to, to how you know how it might look in, in Estonia. What what do you kind of how do you interpret the the need or the um, the possibility of, of you know driving a, a data-driven culture at the DWP? Okay, um, so I'd agree with uh, Sigrid in that data-driven is not the the ambition. Um, the ambition is uh, easier, better, and faster citizen-centered services that the government provides. So from the DWP perspective, we help, uh, nobody really wants to 
um, access our services. They come to us at really difficult points of time in their lives. Um, it's not a, a, you know, a pleasant experience to be out of work or ill or having to deal with, um, uh, with financial issues if you're looking after children. So being data driven should mean that we are able to deliver those services much more easily to the people that need them much faster because we understand more about their context, understand more about um, them in relation to other government services that they may already have access to, and that we're delivering it um, in a sort of more cost-effective way. The other bit is that um, you know, a citizen doesn't um, exist within the, um, the sort of uh, the, the box in which each department operates in. They flow, they have a journey, they move from education through employment, through to pension age. They may have, um, they may have health complications on the way. They may have criminal justice complications on the way. There are a whole load of other factors that affect their journey. And therefore we have to think about services in a much more thematic and um, longitudinal manner. And you can do that by understanding how the data flows in front of a citizen, how it flows while they're um, accessing services and understand the effect and learn from that once they've um, once they've finished. So in terms of being data driven, what we're trying to do is be able to connect up the journeys much more effectively, join up um, events across multiple different services, because um, at the moment we deliver 16 different lines of business. Um, an individual citizen can be in receipt of um, up to seven of those simultaneously, but at the moment they have to apply for all of those things separately. That's not a great customer experience, it's difficult, it's complicated, and by being data driven we should create an easy flow for people to join our services, access the help that they need from multiple different agencies, and then be able to offboard at the appropriate time. From our, um, our colleague perspective, being data driven means that it's much easier to help somebody at the point in, of contact so that we're able to give contextually relevant information to the agent while they're in contact with the citizen so that we're able to help the citizen more quickly and that the agent is able to deliver a better service. So that's what data driven means to, to us. And uh, if I can just stick with you, Paul, mm. if I may, um, we've already touched on this briefly, but the pandemic um, from, from the outside looking in at least would appear to have had an impact in maybe kind of loosening some of the constraints a little bit or certainly <laughs> I'm guessing perhaps not from, from the face you pulled just then, then but um, mm. what has been the impact of the pandemic? Okay. So I wouldn't say it loosened any constraints. Um, what it did was give people um, a much sharper focus. Um, so you know, da data protection um, measures were all still in place. All of the security measures all still in place. Privacy all still in place. However, the shift was a single national focus on delivering support quickly to those that needed it. So the pace at which we identified um, more vulnerable people increased. The ability to engage more effectively across boundaries improved dramatically. And we learned a lot from that, built lots of relationships, and those are continuing um, as we go forward. We were able to test new technologies faster. So we built first of, um, types of data trusts that operated across multiple government departments and included private sector and other agencies in those data trusts in order to be able to deliver services to vulnerable people when they couldn't leave their homes. So we learned a lot through that. We learned um, much more about how we could deliver services, how we could um, identify those um, trigger points in people's lives that, um, that were the moments that mattered where we could engage more effectively and bring in multiple partners to support people um, during those periods. So those are the sorts of things that we're, we're continuing to work with. I mean, the, the, the emergency isn't over, um, we've, it's just shifted, you know, it's, it's moved from a health emergency into what do we do now about the labour market? What do we do now about um, supporting the economy under very difficult circumstances? 
um, and you know, the Department for Work um, and Pensions is involved in that and understanding the dynamics of the labour market um, and how we can help um, support that. But the, the learnings from the pandemic were, um, were significant. I think it, it led to, and I'm sure we'll get on to data literacy, um, but it's not just about understanding charts. Um, there's a lot more to data literacy um, than that. And I think that was really helpful because it's surfaced a lot of the, um, the technical and data debt that is in our system. And uh, we'll probably talk about that later on. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, we, I can see we've got a, a few questions come in from the audience already, which is great. Do keep them coming. Um, we'll get to your questions very shortly. Um, if I may, I'll just quickly bring in Nadoon on, on this um, issue of, of the impact of the pandemic. Paul touched on there the, sense, you know, the, the question of whether or not it's improved data literacy. In, in your kind of interactions with, with customers, uh, have you found a, a growing sense of um, kind of the appreciation of, of data and, and data literacy as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would describe the, the impact or, or, or the, the improvement of data literacy in three high level categories. So I think first one is um, the way organization, even inside public sector, across public sector organizations, how they uh, used to share data, as Paul said, it was already been done, but what the pandemic did was to accelerate both the volume and the, the rate of sharing, still observing all of the, 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 the legalities and everything else. Um, but it wasn't just a public sector, cross public sector data sharing that was needed. Public sector needed to start sharing data with private sector organization. And it was a collective effort of multiple sectors and multiple organizations to address or to respond to fight the pandemic. So in that context, one of the things that I, I have seen and, and speaking to uh, various data leaders as well is it has given a, a lot more people across public sector and private sector to the experience to uh, sort of almost sort of the formation of, you know, there, there has to be a legal and a, either a legal or a commercial contract in terms of sharing data. And a lot of people haven't had that experience of having, you know, establishing a contract and, and, and getting into an agreement of data sharing. I think all of that sort of uh, those activities and the, 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 some of the nuances around contracting has really improved and, and everyone's now got the, confidence having done it uh, to, to you know, boldly to, to go forth and do more data sharing, knowing that it's safe, it's, uh, it's, it, it's done within the, the, the rules of the, the engagement. So that's number one. Number two is the type of data I, I always say uh, has been you know, evolving as well, depending on the, 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 like Paul said, whether it's the emergency or the, the situation, the type of data. So historically, if you go back four or five years, the kind of data that was shared across public sector and many other organizations has, has been each organization sharing in a long history, historical data in a, that, that goes deep into the activities of that particular organization. What the pandemic did was to, to demanding for data which are much, much more um, uh, recent, so you know, fresh data. We call it effervescent data, which is you know, it, it wasn't so much the long history that you needed, but you needed to be situationally aware based on a location or a, a segment of the population. So the nature of the data has has been evolving through the pandemic as well. So there's much more near term data being exchanged across public sector and with private sector value chains and partners. And uh, the frequency of the exchange has to be therefore quite quick as well. So um, that, that, that's the, the, the second sort of insight around the, the exchange of data. Uh, number three is Paul talked about, you know, working within the, the rules of uh, ex the, the, the data privacy and security 
and, and not, not compromising that. The other side of that uh, coin is the public trust. So there's been a number of different conversations or ongoing conversations around um, when government organizations exchange or share data, uh, do you need to go and ask for consent uh, all the time? So a lot of these things are already provisioned through uh, the legislation and, and the latest policies. But I think there is still a, a huge you know, sort of a requirement to tell the public about why you're doing it, the benefits of doing it, because in contrast to you know, the, the public generally not uh, trusting the government to share data, uh, they, they, they share a lot of their personal data with big private sector organizations without any query, right? So what, you know, there, there is a discussion across the industry going on about why, why, why the contrast? And one of the answers is you, you just need to communicate, keep communicating and be absolutely transparent with the public in order to build the, the public trust around uh, using their data, both as an individual organization, but more importantly, when, when they share data across organizations. So those are the sort of three key uh, sort of dynamics that we have observed uh, during the pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, you touched on some really important points there about um, trust and security and, and how that can be embedded in, in the use of data um, and the structures that enable the use of data. Um, let's turn to our audience questions now, because we've got one that's come in on the issue of data protection and, and Sigrid, I'll come to you uh, initially on this one, uh, if I may. You, I think you talked about in your um, opening answer that data sharing in Estonia, it doesn't just mean the sharing of the data itself, it means everything that is necessary for that, including the security systems. Um, and one of our audience members wants to know, how do we balance data sharing with the need to have data protection mechanisms in place. Um, what does that look like for, for you guys in Estonia? Is it technical? Is it the right processes and rules? How do you ensure that data protection is a really um, key uh, and inherent part of, of data sharing? Um, yes, um, I think we have to understand that the data exchange in, on the uh, X road is exchanged only to provide services. And no public agency just provides services. They have the obligation by law to do something. So in order for them to be able to do something, they have to have the data. And, and so they have the... Uh, ability or they, they can use my personal data if they are dealing with me. Um, and I, I was just thinking when uh, Paul said uh, and talked about the pandemic, pandemic and what it did. And I also feel that the data protection mechanisms or laws or whatever, they were in place and they were really never hindering anything. If we take, for example, uh, sharing of um, uh, of the health open data, how many uh, 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 vaccinations or how many sick people. And before in Estonia, like open data and health data, they couldn't be further apart from each other. And that had nothing to do with any laws of uh, data protection or anything like that. That was totally um, a made up social norm. And maybe they also used it as an excuse to just not do it. Um, and so I definitely think that data protection laws are, are not a bad thing. They are here to guide us. But and if you, uh, for us at least, uh, and that wasn't the shade, we have to deal with the EU uh, di uh, directives as well. And when they, they often come and they are really tight and they have all these rules and regulations, we have to really define those and say what it does. And if it isn't really useful, we have to fight for it to be useful. But we can't just go over there and say, nothing you have proposed is really important because um, 
I think in some cases, data protection laws should even be tighter and they should really go hand in hand when you think about data sharing, because if you have uh, the obligation to do something, you will inevitably get the data because you need it. And with open data as well, um, I mean, again, as Naduna also said, uh, trust, public trust, uh, data protection laws help to build that trust and and you can just, I mean, they're not all bad is what I'm saying and they definitely don't hinder anything if you really understand them and uh, yeah. I mean there's some really important points there and Paul I'd like to, to perhaps mm. bring you in on um, um, I guess a couple of issues that the cigarette um, uh, raised there. Firstly, the, the data protection measures. Uh, obviously, in the UK, we have the, the Data Protection Act. Um, do you, I mean, are, are the regulations that we have, and I guess the government processes that we have, um, would you kind of echo Sigrid's um, sense that they're not they're not really a hindrance? Uh, and also, uh, I'd just like to get your comments, if I may, on the issue of, of public trust and whether that, the extent to whether that's a barrier in any way or a lack of public trust, should I say? Or okay. Uh, that well, first of all, there, there isn't um, there isn't a trade-off between data sharing or data protection. It, it's all it's all part of the um, the same package. And if you don't have data protection and demonstrably good, strong data protection, then you instantly lose the trust of the people that require um, the services. So we couldn't operate if customers didn't trust that we were looking after their data because we we have incredibly vulnerable people um, accessing our services and therefore our primary concern is maintaining their data protection their trust and delivering services to them in a secure manner now the the challenge with data sharing is being specific about what you need the data for it's you know it's not a um, it's not a technical or a legal challenge. It's about defining what the outcome is and being clear about what the minimum data um, set is in order to achieve that and being proportionate about the amount of data that you're asking for. So none of this is difficult. What it requires is a, a, a really strong solution focus from the people that are asking for the data. Now, if you can get that and you can be clear about what the outcome is, what data you need and why you need it, then a data share is very straightforward to arrange. Um, now, the actual execution of that data share can be difficult because of some of the, um, the technical debt and the engineering required in order to get that data, turn it into the product and then move it. So there are practical considerations in terms of, um, of the, the varying states of the data in various platforms and some of which is not compatible with the target environment. Um, and you know, we experience that internally within DWP as well as sharing with, with partners. Um, I guess the, uh, another bit of this is, um, is making sure that we, um, we are clear about the purpose of, of data protection and recognizing and the, the big shift with with GDPR will be that it's a few years ago now was really recognizing that the data wasn't ours it always belongs to the person who gave it to us and therefore you know we sort of think about it a bit like when you take your money to a bank as a um, the first time you give it to the, the cashier at any given point in time you can get some of it or all of it back and you know what's happened to it afterwards. And so you know, that's a really important part of, of the trust. The final bit is that um, in the UK, we have various bits of primary legislation under which each department operates. And that sets up the legal basis for the share in the first instance. Now, some of those, um, they're, not, um, they're not equitable across the whole ecosystem. So for example, we can share data backwards and forwards with some departments, but they don't necessarily have the legal basis to share data back with us. So there's a, there is a challenge because now we've moved into an environment where data sharing is much more part of the way we operate. 
just to try and smooth that relationship across the whole piece. So I think that's that's the only blocker, but it's not a, it's neither a data sharing issue nor a data protection issue. It's a sort of procedural issue that can be ironed out separately. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, we've got a couple of uh, other questions coming, particularly on, on big data and unstructured data. We'll, we'll get to those in just a sec and a reminder that we've still got 20 minutes left and we do encourage you to get Get your questions in continue to do so um but nadine if i can just come to you i guess we're talking here about the challenges being faced we've talked about the um the challenges around uh, security and trust um from your experience working with customers are there any other major challenges um that we haven't identified yet in terms of perpetuating data sharing and, and data driven culture um i guess that that word culture might be a, a key key point uh, what are the kind of other major barriers you find that organizations face and how can how can they be overcome yeah so i think i think there are the the both the barriers are, are the barriers are the same uh, as the opportunities that organizations face um so as i in my opening remarks i said um the the the, the shift and the the evolution of you know data being now sort of something that everyone thinks about as opposed to just the the data professionals which is a, a massively uh, beneficial position to be in and and mostly out of necessity as well to, in order to face the, the the challenges that organizations or the to achieve the objectives of the organizations that, that as they go forward so so both the ba the barrier is if you know as an organ as a public sector organization if everyone within the organization isn't thinking about data in whatever terminology you use whether it's data or information but the the value of the data helping uh, that individual to to do a better job or to deliver a better service is the kind of cultural aspect that both evolving and and you need to sort of help and accelerate the evolution of it uh, I think Paul referred to this before around data fluency, data literacy, and these are kind of things that you can actually accelerate and and sort of uh, uh, encourage people through education proactively to to improve the uh, the awareness of of the importance of data and the usage of it to to improve public services. So, uh, lots of organisations in public sector are actively you know, with the sponsorship from the, the very top of the executive team uh, are now, uh, I have seen, in, including, you know, Paul's organization, um, are running programs to uh, educate people both around data literacy, but also uh, uh, data-driven culture is a, is a kind of a theme that's happening across the, the public sector. So that, I think that as well as you know that being a barrier i think there are lots of things happening to uh, proactively encourage it the, the second aspect of um, getting the outcomes and the benefits of better use of data uh, is the, the actual technical side of it so as well as everyone thinking about data using data effect effectively to improve the, the public services that they deliver there is always the, the the engine room of an organization where there's a lot of technology uh, is is involved and the 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 universal in a pattern across public sector in in across the world is that there's a lot of technical debt you know there has been systems that have uh, been um, uh, maintained over, over a lot of you know legacy systems so uh, the whole journey of how do you uh, go from you know upgrading the legacy systems on to mod to modernize them uh, the complexities of that that process and and let's be honest uh, you know the the biggest issue is is there enough given there has been a lot of tech debt it, within public sector in terms of investment on infrastructure relating to data and other uh, applications how do you, th there's a constant challenge of how do you keep ahead of the tech debt and being able to to do all of these improvements? So, 
there is a, a, a conversation happening across public sector and the data leaders around how do you make the case for investment, not only at an individual departmental level, but as a, as a sector as a whole, into, for example, in the UK, how do we make the case for, for even more investment from the, the UK Treasury around uh, data and infrastructure and, and, and technology that goes with it? Um, and, and part of that conversation is about how, how would all of the, the collective public sector data leaders make a consistent and a, uh, a business case that is consistent across the board that, that a central organization like the Treasury, for example, uh, will understand and, and in the way you make the argument to be consistent. So these are some of the latest sort of conversations, dialogues happening in that space to, to make the case. Great, thank you. Um, some really, really powerful insights there. Um, but as I said, we've had a, we've actually had a few more questions from our audience come in. So I think let's um, let's try and address um, a few of those now. We've had a, a couple that I'll, I'll kind of meld into one, if I may. Um, we've had a couple of people asking about whether we're seeing growth in the use of unstructured data or big data, uh, and the kind of tools that can be used to analyze that and provide insights, um, particularly AI-powered AI tools. Um, we had uh, a comment here from a, one of our attendees uh, who says they attended a data science mastery course run by a number 10 and cabinet office that they found really useful to, uh, to help them use data science principles to extract um, meaningful insights. Um, if you're interested in that, I, I would also um, personally point you towards the, the work of the ONS data science campus. I think they do some really um, interesting stuff. Um, but Sigrid, if I can come to you uh, on this question of the use of big data or unstructured data, is that something you're kind of experimenting with um, in, in Estonia? How does that, what do you see, do you see a role for, for using that kind of data? And, and if so, what, what does that look like? Mm, I wish I could say that we are using it every day. Um, I, I say, I think you're still talking about it and everyone is talking about how important it is and all the uh, possibilities that it will bring, but there aren't any, any real use cases I, I can name. But what I have seen that is kind of troubling is that, uh, and it kind of ties into the question, is the uptake of all these data warehouses and data lakes um, many agencies already have them and somewhere along the way agencies have really kind of thought that databases have all these data protection rules and data lakes are just the wild wild west where you can put all the personal data together and then create all these new uh, insights. I mean new insights are great but when we actually started to look at what's in those data lakes. Um, I think it's troubling and I'm all for innovation, but if you use personal data, because also uh, the uh, X-Road enables this uh, data tracker uh, thing where we can log on to the ac.ee, the national portal, and have a look who has been querying my data. But that's on a query basis kind of thing. When you now put all my personal data into the data lake and you don't have the data tracker uh, thing installed, I cannot see it. And that I feel like is, is a potential threat uh, when something like that comes out and we will lose a lot of data uh, per, uh, trust in, in the government. And so I'm all for talking about the use of unstructured data and creating all these new insights and possibilities. But when we are talking about this, we have to talk about uh, the more boring side, the legal, and, and we are kind of now starting, but we should do it uh, sooner. And we have, yeah. Uh, just to, to uh, if I can stick with you, Sigrid, if I may, um, in terms of the use of AI, I know that's um, something that, that's uh, 
obviously playing an important role in, in the context of the virtual assistant um, program that you're uh, you're working on in Estonia. Could you just briefly tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, in Estonia, we have many AI uh, use cases already, but Bürokrat is kind of um, this new channel where we use the chatbot to answer uh, citizens' questions because we see that um, many agencies get uh, requests or questions that don't really belong to them. And uh, because of our laws, the agency has to um, answer back at least in five working days. But it really is annoying if you get the answer that it isn't our topic. So bureaucrat should kind of have this uh, hive mind or the message room where it can uh, listen in on the uh, queries that people make and then direct it uh, to the agency or if it can answer it itself or also provide uh, public services like my driver's license is uh, expiring please get me a new one and if it has the data it needs uh, it can query it from uh, the registries and uh, pre-order and I don't have to really do anything so it kind of is this way of providing citizens uh, state services in a totally new way and be more uh, proactive uh, but I am we haven't done it in a very user-centric way so now we are going a step back and asking uh, citizens what type of services they would like to uh, be able to get from Durakat because not every type of service is really necessary and it's not really very comfortable to get everything from this really small screen anyway. So we have to really step, take a step back. But in order, yeah, it's, I think of it as more of a new channel that uses all these new uh, ways of uh, new technical uh, possibilities to really still provide the same services just in a more uh, convenient way. Great, thank you. Really, really fascinating project. Um, I'd love to hear more about if we had uh, a bit more time, but we just, um, we're just entering into the last sort of 10 minutes or so. Um, so before we kind of come, come to our panelists for some closing thoughts, let's address a, a really important question I think that came in from our audience. Uh, a couple of um, uh, comments we've had about it actually. Um, one uh, of our viewers uh, said it's imperative to build in data quality to approaches. Data quality standards vary wildly, and this can undermine public confidence in public services if we draw the wrong conclusions from data that we collate. Um, and uh, another of our viewers um, kind of phrased it as a question, I guess. Um, do organisations place enough importance on the quality of their captured data? Um, Paul, if I can come to you on that one, if I may. Uh, is this, um, have we identified an important issue here? Is, is data quality something that needs a bit more focus in, in your experience and how do we ensure that um, it gets the necessary focus? Data quality is always important. Um, so, uh, but I suppose it, it, it depends a little bit on whether you're talking about um, structured or unstructured data. Um, so there's a, there's a whole range of stuff we would do with, um, with unstructured data where um, variable quality is just part and parcel of leveraging that um, particular type of, of data. So, for instance, we, um, we do large scale text anal analytics using natural language processing on public job adverts um, on platforms like Adzuna to understand the dynamics of the labour market and the demand for skills in different places. Now, the quality of that is incredibly variable um, and that's part, and, uh, part of using those sorts of techniques. However, on our um, structured system, so when people um, apply for a benefit, the quality between those systems is also variable because they were all developed at different times, some of them in different agencies. So we've come together through a process of sort of merger and acquisition, if you like. Um, and the, um, the policies under which those lines of benefits were developed 
are different. So, for instance, some policies determine that it's important to capture skills. Other policies determine that it's not important to capture ethnicity, as a for instance. And therefore, you know, we have very different data quality and structures between benefits and the way in which the systems were designed, some of which don't have data input quality um, filtering at the outset. So it's a really important part and uh, quality is something that we are working on um, across the piece in order to both improve the interaction with citizens and improve our ability to understand the dynamics of how the, um, the department and our operations work. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think we are uh, uh, we are just ticking into the last couple of minutes. So perhaps um, if we now think about getting some, some closing thoughts from our panelists, um, I think we've we've covered a lot of ground today. We sort of begun by exploring what what a data driven culture looks like, and then kind of talked about some of the challenges that are faced in that, and some of the the examples and, and use cases that are currently um, kind of showing the, the potential of, of all that. Um, perhaps if we think now for, for our viewers, um, if they were to take away, let's say, two or three kind of key things, key actions they could do to, to kind of perpetuate this in their own organisations and really drive a data driven culture and, and get the most out of data. Um, Paul, if I can stick with you, uh, if I may, what, what would you kind of highlight or, or single out as a couple of really powerful things that, that people could take away? Um so what's the point of being data driven? It's um, to deliver the outcomes that your organisation is there to uh, to achieve. So from our perspective, it's delivering a really good customer service um, to people who are vulnerable and need support quickly. So the whole data driven element of that and the culture is how do we bring all of the capabilities that we have to bear on that particular problem? Um, so that's the, the first bit. The second bit is um, data literacy. And it's, it's not just understanding what data looks like when you visualize it in a, in a chart or um, understanding performance metrics. Data literacy is also about data protection. It's about understanding where data comes from, data quality, and how it flows through an organization to achieve an outcome. And I think building that picture up for, um, for colleagues across the organisation so that they understand the difficulties and can help um, support that is another important factor. Great, thank you. Um, I understand you may need to, to leave at 11 sharp, Paul. Um, so if we're still prattling on for another minute or two beyond that, then uh, no worries if you need to kind of slip away quietly. It's been great to, to have you here. Um, but Sigrid, if I could come to you now for, for some closing thoughts, what would you kind of pick out as two, two or three really key things organisations could do to, to really improve uh, how data driven they are or, or how they really make the most of, of the data at their disposal? Yeah, I think Paul took the best one, <laughs> but I would say, um, and it may seem like a bit random, but I would uh, say to look around uh, and to, just to prevent yourself from like inventing the real or repeating someone someone's mistakes because uh, there's definitely a lot of not if not in the UK then maybe in some other countries where you can just uh, learn from others experiences because I think public services at least in Europe are kind of the same uh, I don't want to hurt anyone but you have to provide same type of services so you should ask maybe how your neighboring country is doing it and maybe they already have uh, great use cases that you can just uh, um, take on but and also um, kind of goes in hand with that is to also remember that you should also share your mistakes and successes uh, and maybe even important to really share your mistakes and that may be among uh, the UK's uh, civil servants so that others won't fear uh, to be data driven and really build up this community where you can share and then learn together. And I think that's kind of the softer side of this, but it's really important and will, I think, greatly help uh, many agencies. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a really key part of any 
transformation, sharing mistakes. I, I know um, it can be quite difficult, I think, particularly for, for people working uh, in government. Um, so that's a really, really powerful kind of message. Um, Nadine, finally, if I can uh, come to you, what would you kind of single out as, as a, a few key takeaways uh, in terms of how, how we can take the ideas we talked about today and, and viewers at home can kind of perpetuate them in their organizations going forward? So a couple of takeaways we've already discussed, and, and if I very quickly, I will introduce one third one that we haven't discussed. But so I think both Paul and Sikh have been talking about the the improvement around the awareness and the data literacy of, of data driven across public sector organizations. It's happening already, and you know, doing more of it is brilliant, and ultimately. If every public sector organization starts to own data at the board level or, or executive team level, I think that will be the ultimate dream. And, and given the, and, and it, it's not a nice to have, I think given the journey of public, public service delivery organizations, they ha that it has to become a, a, a must do in order to uh, improve the public services in, under the, the, the circumstances that we operate within. The second one we talked about public trust. We need to keep doing as public sector organization more and more to educate the public as to why data is being shared, how it's done and why it's been done. Third element we didn't have time to talk about today, but for another time to go into detail is the thing we didn't talk about is the, the deep technical skills you need uh, in, in order to get the best value out of data. So we briefly touched upon AI, you know, there are lots of new technological improvements that you can utilize to squeeze much better value out of data. But globally, across all sectors, private and public, uh, there aren't enough people who, who's got these deep skills. So for another session, we probably ought, ought to, you know, think about and, and there's massive amounts of conversations going on around how would a, what's the best way for a public sector organization to build this skill set uh, or, or to source this skill set within an organization? And one of the key emerging topics is public sector organizations sharing uh, resource skills and people across public sector almost as a cooperative group, as opposed to try and build everything inside your own organization. So that's something to as a takeaway to think about, and, and hopefully we'll get an opportunity in the future to, to go into more detail. Thank you. Well, absolutely. I think that um, the, the issue of skills and how public sector organizations can meet it is, is gonna resonate and manifest for, for, for you know, many months and, and probably years to come. Uh, and that would be, that could fill many, many hours of, of conversation. But uh, unfortunately we are, we are out of time today. As you said, Nadine, there's probably an awful lot we didn't get to cover. Um, if uh, you're joining us today and there was something you, you wanted to follow up on or something you feel you didn't quite hear enough about, um, then do please get in touch with us. Um, I'm sure we can connect you to, to any of our panelists if you wanted to um, uh, to connect with them or, or you can seek them out um, yourselves. But uh, I hope you've derived some value from, from this discussion this morning. It's been really great for me to be uh, a part of it. Um, and all that remains is for me to uh, give a massive, massive thank you to Sigrid Nadine and Paul, it's been great to be in your company. Really enjoyed hearing your insights. Uh, and a big thank you to you as well for joining us this morning. We do hope to see you again soon.